some of you may not be may not be familiar with the network at the National Library of Medicine. Um, so I'm going to start off with telling you a little bit about us. Um, so the NNLM is funded by the National Library of Medicine, which is the world's largest biomedical library. The NNLM is the outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine. So the National Library of Medicine is a part of the National Institutes of Health, which is the nation's leading research agency. So us at the NNLM, we have what's called ROCs, or regions, offices, and centers, and it's made up of seven regional medical libraries, four national information centers, and three national offices, which provide training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. If you'd like to learn more about the NNLM, feel free to visit our website at nnlm.gov. Um, so I am going to move on to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Dion, or D. Rosader, is a science communication, engagement, and outreach expert who has previously worked with nonprofits, universities, government offices, and for-profit businesses to improve their science engagement efforts. This includes creating new and or improving existing science communication, marketing, education, diversity, outreach, and outreach initiatives. He is currently the executive director for Science of Cal, a program that shares the excitement and relevance of UC Berkeley research with public audiences through lectures, street fairs, festivals, and more. Um, she also works with scientists across the campus to build sustainable and impactful um, science outreach collaborations with community and campus partners. These previous positions include Director of Mass Media Fellowship at the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Scientific Programs and Outreach Manager at the Carnegie Institution for Science. Dee received her bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley and her PhD from UC Santa Cruz, both in Earth and Planetary Sciences. So I now want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Dee Rosetter. Hi. <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself from my little screeny screen and I couldn't figure out how to do it. But you all can hear me now, right? Yeah, so we can hear okay. you. <laughs> I was like, how do I get back to that? I'm not used to WebEx. Sorry, guys. That took a little bit of a moment. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone for being here. I know we have actually a really beautiful crowd right now. Lots of folks in. Let me get the chat up on my screen too because I want to see y'all chatting because I do have some questions. That's my first my first thing I want to do. Um, I, well, maybe I'll do a, like Tiffany said, you have heard a little bit more of my background. I'll, I'll do a little bit of um, an explanation for why I'm here and why I'm presenting what I'm presenting. Um, but first, I just wanted to ask you just to get the ball rolling. What did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, so add that to the chat. I always like these responses because oftentimes they're much different than the jobs we currently have now. See, the chat is all the way up there. Let me see if I can. Uh, I see the chat now. <laughs> Can you guys see this Canva live session thing on the side of the screen? Yes. That's so weird. Let me get out of there. Mm. Oh, you know what I need to do? I think I need to come down here. There we go. It's gone now. Good. Okay. Now I gotta go find that chat button. Where did the chat go? Hmm. Oh, here's the chat. 
if I knew. <laughs> I'm so used to just Zoom. <laughs> okay. A firefighter, an event, and an opera singer. Oh, I love it. Does the person who wanted to be an opera singer still sing opera? A pilot, a marine biologist, a firefighter, a golfer. Anything with animals. That's probably what mine do. A scientist. Mm. Archaeologist, pediatrician, naturalist. I love these. I was probably wanting to be not, I didn't know how boring this, this job seems now to me, but back in the day, sorry if I'm, if I'm offending anyone who's an accountant, but I wanted to be an accountant. Like what child wants to be an accountant? <laughs> And I think that I wanted to be an accountant because I loved math. And I was like, oh, what's a job where you just get to play with numbers all day? And I don't know, maybe somebody said accountant to me. So I used to go around telling people I wanted to be an accountant. So I just wanted to kind of break the ice a little bit um, since we will be doing a little bit of sharing today. Um, that's kind of a fun one. Um, so, and you'll see, I love animals too. So I have a, a dog theme that you'll see repeatedly throughout, um, a statistician. Yes. <laughs> oh, an actuary. I wouldn't th think about that. Um, oh, I'm glad music is still part of your life, Kate. All right. So. I just, again, just expand a little bit about my, on my background. I like to do this. I'm actually giving three sessions. Um, this is my first one. And I always sort of talk about just a little bit about who I am and what I do. Um, because actually, if any of you want to get in contact with me, I encourage you to do that. Um, you'll see, because I have a PhD and now a non-traditional career path that a lot of times folks will reference um, people who are sort of in the space where they are trying to figure out what they're going to do next in their career. They send them my way. So I'm happy to talk to anyone or, or have conversations with you all about your work. So please feel free to do that. Um, I did start in physics at UC Berkeley. So I'm at Berkeley now. So go Bears. Um, if we have any other Bears in the audience, please let me know. I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to go Bears you. Um, and I actually was a little, you know, I, I wasn't having the best time in physics. I was the only woman, um, or sorry, I was the only person of color. There were two women in the major that year. Um, and I started doing atmospheric science. Um, I started working at the National Center for Atmospheric uh, Research and Science, and I fell in love with atmospheric science and the application of physics. And I bring that up because it was a minority serving program. And so I really felt like I became part of a community and I became part of a science community um, very quickly through that program. So if folks are feeling out of whack or have not found their community yet, this was a place where it was something that I was able to sort of finally feel like I was a scientist and like I belonged, which we all know is very important in science. Um, at Berkeley, uh, I, was an, I was an undergrad during the bush Kerry election. And uh, Bush won for a second term. We we're in the middle of a war, and um, folks were at Berkeley were, were not happy about this. Um, and it was a contentious election. And uh, after the day after the elections, uh, the a lot of the classes were canceled, and folks weren't going in. And professors were emailing everyone saying, you know, it's not like a day of mourning. There was upside down flag hanging off of the Earth and Planetary Sciences building at Berkeley. And my atmospheric science, climate science professor held class that day. And she said to us, I'm hosting class today because I want you to be here because I, this is an important message. The exit poll showed that people do not care as they went into the their polling booths about things that we care so intimately about, that we are so passionate about. And these are things like public health, climate change, the environment, energy solutions. And she said, this is a huge issue because as we're sitting here sort of mourning what we should, what we thought was going to be an election in one direction, what really was a election in the other direction because these core issues were being ignored. And guess what? That's my fault. That's our fault. That's the ivory tower's fault. 
we are not doing a great job communicating what we know with the public about not just uh, the science, but the importance of the science and how that science affects people's lives and policy and, again, health and environment, all of these things. And it was really the first time that I was told, and I think I was a senior at this point, that I had a responsibility as a scientist to communicate my research with the public. And this was a message that I think now is being uh, really championed across universities and across government agencies and National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health and where I am now, right? This is something that we know is very important and hopefully folks aren't having to have a contentious election their senior year of college to hear that message, but it really changed my life. I started working at the Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley, which is a science museum um, where I currently work. Yeah. I love Lawrence Hall Science too. Um, luckily, I had the opportunity to work there as an undergrad and work there between uh, undergrad and graduate school. And in graduate school, um, I decided to go back to science, even though I really, truly wasn't, sh I want, knew I wanted to go into public engagement, science communication, science outreach, science policy, learning about diversity and equity um, issues in science. But I decided to get my PhD, which was is actually pretty rare even today for folks to know that they don't want to be a traditional bench scientist or an academic scientist and go into grad school, sign up for the next five to seven years of their life knowing that they're not going to be an academic traditional scientist. Um, that's still pretty rare. And But this was 20 years ago, so that was very rare back then. Um, and I did that. And I, again, found a, my group, I found a clique, I found my friends, I found my friends, I survived grad school. But the whole time, because I knew I wanted to do some of these other, have uh, other experiences, I'm going to encourage if there's any grad students in the room to, as soon as you pass your quals, just start doing some of these things that also make you and keep you happy. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I did was I participated in the AAAS Mass Media Science and Engineering Fellows Program um, that I'm going to encourage you to look up later. I have a whole slide of resources at the end of this presentation that we'll also send out to the folks here, I believe, right, Tiffany? Um, so you'll be able to get your hands on a bunch of things. But one of the things the Mass Media Fellows Program does is that it creates more accurate science news, it creates better science communication among scientists, and it's an alternative career path. So you, maybe some of you know some Mass Media Fellows alums. Um, you do now, because I'm an alum. <laughs> uh, the scientists are placed in news outlets across the country. When I was a the fellow, these were some of these news sites, LA Times, Chicago Tribune, Philly Inquirer, NPR, Wired, National Geographic. Um, so it's a really great program to hone your science communication skills and think about your research in another lens and a lens that's really applicable to public audiences. When I finished my PhD, again, this is when I realized I had no idea how to get a job outside of academia because I was trained to be an academic. So now, like I said, I talk a lot about a career is away from the bench and alternative careers in science, and I, I think a lot about transferable skills and self-marketing. And again, if you come to one, I have a talk specifically on branding and marketing for scientists, both inside of academia, outside of academia. How do we think about ourselves as being sci scientists and workers and skilled workers and having all of these uh, great experiences within uh, our lifetimes, within our academic careers, and how that's applicable for the world, whether or not that be an ac academic position or not. So please, I hope you attend that talk as well. I've had a really amazing, colorful career since I finished my PhD. Um, I worked at AAAS, as Tiffany said, Carnegie. I run a ton of uh, workshops on science communication and inclusive SciComm and, like I said, marketing. I host tons of events. I think about, you know, I've been uh, running some programs at the White House Easter Egg Roll for years, so I get to go to the White House and do fun science. Um, and one of the things that I do now is I run the mass media science, or excuse me, the science, science at Cal program. I totally went backwards there. Um, so Science at Cal is a program at UC Berkeley that brings the wonder and excitement of, of UC Berkeley research to the community. So we host uh, four lectures uh, or talks or events a month. They're all different. Some are in Spanish, some are on campus, some are off campus, some are in cafes. Um, we, we partner with groups across 
uh, all of the East Bay consulates, libraries. We we partner with the Lawrence Hall Science Community Centers. We are at festivals. So in addition to our four events, we do street fairs, festivals, science, um, you know, innovation fairs, all types of ways in which we can get the scientists. It's not necessarily about me at all. It's about our highlighting our scientists and getting them to engage one-on-one -on -one with the public. So we have a lot of efforts that do that. So if you, and this job, just another plug for alternative careers, this job, every job I've had has required that I've had a PhD. So if you're curious about careers, again, with a PhD and how that might change the outlook of your career, trust me, it's not a bad thing. Um, I also work with scientists on their broader impacts. This is broader impacts is NSF's jargon word for outreach, education, communication. Again, these things that the government is saying are things that are required pieces of working as a scientist being funded by taxpayer dollars. It's not just that your, your science is strong, it's that it's impacting society in a way that's also uh, it's also impactful. One, it's not just happening, it's impactful. It's working. You're evaluating how the, your programs are doing, and we're making sure that we're building on not just our research, but on our activities that impact society as well. So I help UC Berkeley uh, find opportunities with partners on and off campus, and I help them develop their broader impact plans or their outreach plans. So I work with scientists across the university to do that. Um, okay, so now that we have a, a little bit about my background and what I do and how I'm here to help you, um, we do want to dive into the art of SciComm because that's what we're here to talk about today. This is my favorite subject in the world. This makes my heart flutter and I'm so happy to be here. I'm so and happy to be invited to be here again. Here's my email address if you want to tweet at me or go to my website um, or learn more about me. We can do that. So what I'm going to start off with is we're just going to dive right in. And I want to ask you, you can either pull out a piece of paper. I like writing on paper. You could either open up a doc and start writing in a doc. But what I want you to do is I want you to eventually share this. So I'm going to add a link to the chat. Actually, I think I already have it linked here um, to a, a Google Doc where I'm going to give you, I'm going to time, I'm going to give you, how about three minutes? Because I want you to sort of think about a scientific topic. So it's what do you study? What's some, if you're a scientist, what do you study? I think that that's a good place to start. Or what's some information that you want to convey? So California is going through um, a process where we're about, we're going electric vehicle, uh, all vehicles sold in California will be electric vehicle by the year 2025 or 2030. I can't remember the exact year off the top of my head right now. But anyways, it's a big deal. And also we just went through a heat wave. And so the electric grid uh, was we had some rolling blackouts and there's a lot of fear around, well, like if we're going to go all electric, then why don't, why would we want to go to electric cars or why would we want to go all electric when our, we can't even handle our electric grid as it is? So I have been doing a lot of communicating in the last few weeks about our electric grid. So I'm a climate scientist. I would say, even though I have lots of topics that I want to talk about, that's the one that I would choose right now for me. So it can be something that you work on or something that you want to talk about with the public, um, anything like that. But I just want you to write down one to three sentences. Go hydrogen, thanks. <laughs> I want you to write down or write in a Google Doc one to three sentences. And then what I want you to do is I'm actually going to go in here. Sorry. And you are going to choose one of these sticky notes, move it over here. And I want you to not just tell me what you want to talk about, but give me one to three sec sentences. You can either, and there's sticky notes all over these. There's enough for everyone's here today. And I want you to have your own. You don't have to write your name. Um, you don't have to uh, say who you are. You can just go in and start typing on one of these sticky notes. And uh, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to shut up for you and I'm going to give you three minutes to do that and then I'll warn you for an extra minute to get it on the sticky note. You can Again, you can use a piece of paper or a Google Doc to um, to talk about, uh, sorry about, I don't know how many screens you can see, but um, 
to uh, write it in the sticky note. You'll have about a minute to write it in the sticky note. So I'll set my timer. Again, one to three sentences. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> one more minute. Let's go one more because that was my warning. So if you haven't started adding your Your one to three sentences on a post-it, please do. Feel free to start scrolling if you're done and reading what all of the amazing people who are in the Zoom meeting do like I'm doing. You're all, you're all so fascinating. Does anyone want to unmute and share? I'd love for you to just share with all of us. So they can't unmute themselves, oh. but if there's somebody who wants to volunteer, um, let us know in chat, and I can. Oh, unmute okay. Them. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I actually, I'm not even sure if I can unmute them. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that yeah. we're all sitting here looking at the post-it notes then, because I think that that's um, exactly what I'd ask everyone to do: is go through and look at those post-it notes, and we we don't need any sharing. Then that's fine. Totally fine. All right, so that's good. I wanted us to kind of get our creative juices flowing. I also wanted you to tell me what you did without any blank, right? It's like if we were at a cocktail party or a cafe and I looked over at you and was like, hey, what do you do? This is what you'd say to me, right? This is what I'm doing. This is what I do. This is what I study. This is some interest in I have in science or non-science work. Um, so that's wonderful. That's exactly what I wanted to see from you. I'm going to, again, switch gears. I'll go back to presenting. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of these, like I said, I was doing a lot of, com uh, com I've been having a lot of conversations about the electric grid. So um, that's because that's this a sticking point that's right now. There, I've seen a lot of memes about like, people being very angry about this um, in California and kind of putting, you know, electric vehicles down or, or electrifying anything, you know, moving away from natural gas and those sorts of things. So these are things that I gravitate towards because it's always a challenge for me to communicate those things and do it effectively. But there are a lot of these issues um, from the environment to, you know, vaccine efficacy is huge obviously right now for a number of reasons um you know we these slides were created long before COVID, and there's always all these kind of uh ways in which COVID integrates itself into my slides um but again energy policy fluoride gmos right these are all things that there's these sticking points so the question is why do we have these pro this problem where we're trying to um have a conversation between scientists and the public, whoever that may be, and there's maybe some misunderstanding there. Well, first of all, there's cultural and political considerations that are tried and true. Um, unfortunately, if you ask people whether or not they're a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat, that will literally help you determine see here um, how much folks think that uh, climate change, if human activity is contributing to climate change. So we know that that correlation exists. The economy, when the economy is doing really well, people have time to worry and concentrate on areas of science or be excited about areas of science that they that they that might be contingent in other periods when the economy is not doing well again like as it relates to energy and fuel and i have a very climatey view of of all of my slides because of that so bear with me but y'all are with me i'm sure um there's huge dis disinformation campaigns there just is um we know that there are organizations and people who deliberately uh create misinformation and disinformation for the public there's historical and intuitive how can we be impacting the climate when i have i'm just a little old me and the earth has been around for billions of years and it's survived like what what do i have anything to do with it right that's intuitive there's a science literacy issue that we have you know whether or not people the difference between public and scientists and how this their science literacy uh is determined by uh, you know, how much education you have or what race you are and all of these sorts of things. Um, so this is a real issue as well. But the biggest thing and the thing that we're going to focus on today, because we have power over these things, is how scientists communicate. 
So we're going to start there. And scientists are trained in a very special way to communicate. They're trained to use jargon because we can pack a ton of information into one word. And that's a great thing because that means that we can communicate very effectively. We don't have to waste time with a lot of words, right? It's a very, very eff effective and efficient way to communicate. We include all of our data and all of our caveats, and that's because we want to create sound science that other people can replicate and that we can defend when we write our publications and that when we're at scientific conferences, again, great for science work. And the data speaks for itself. So we don't do a ton of um, narrative or stories or anything that kind of strays from our data, the interpretation of the data, dot period, that's it. So this is something, again, that is science to science communication serves a really great purpose. It's there for a reason. Now, the problems come in is that when we think about communication, just recipe for good communication, these are things like simple, clear messages in plain language. And if you think about the juxtaposition of simple, clear messages in plain language with using jargon, those things are not compatible, right? These are opposite ends of the spectrum. In addition, we want to repeat key messages over and over and over again. That's different than including all the data and all the caveats, right? These are things that's, again, juxtaposition. They're very different from each other. And using stories and analogies and metaphors and all these things that we use as tools to communicate outside of the world of science. And so we become, which is not a bad thing, we become a space where we're doing, where we're trained to communicate in a way that's opposite in the way that we communicate about anything else. So um, here's a, a really great article, and this is based off a science uh, a journal article that came out about how scientific jargon, papers that use a lot of scientific jargon don't get referenced as much as papers that don't use scientific jar jargon. And this is to say that even though we use these practices in our own scientific spaces, in the scientific enterprise, it might not always be in our best interest to do that, especially when we're trying to communicate our research, like in publications to other scientists, who we want them to use our research to, to support their own research. This is another great study that I love. This just shows that there are there are times in which we're using either pitches, live conversations, professional profiles, these sorts of things where the, I hate these low and high status, but early career researchers use a lot more jargon in their communication styles than more advanced communicators, or excuse me, more advanced scientists at the later stages of their career. They use less and less jargon. Now, that is just uh, you know, this study shows that there are other kind of issues that arise when you get later and later in your career as it relates to communication, because you probably have all of your, your slide decks already finished, and you don't want to change those, even though we know it's in our best interest to make edits and update how we're communicating our, in our papers or in our, in our presentations. But we know, again, that younger, uh, early career folks use a lot more jargon. Um, it wouldn't be a great SciComm talk without a PhD comic. So let's read this one. And this happened to me at my PhD defense party. My sister picked up my thesis, my big fat thesis, and she opened it up. And I was like, oh, having fun, a little light reading. She was like, no, I can't even get past the title. She was like, I don't even understand the title. I was like, give it back to me because I just worked six years on that, right? Like, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so observational studies in micro, of microphysical properties in marine stratic cumulus means nothing to my sister, right? Probably means nothing to you. So have you all heard of the deficit model? The deficit model says that our lack of understanding and therefore our skepticism and hostility towards science is due to a lack of information. Therefore, the more information will lead to a better understanding. We just need to give people more information. Well, again, it wouldn't be a SciComm presentation without an Onion article. So this is one of my favorites. And this is true. Every few years we're publishing reports that kind of is you know, republishing of the last report, right? 
And we know, unfortunately, that the deficit model, or fortunately, it doesn't work. Scientists like to get louder. They like to give more and more data, you can see in the background, so we're screaming at what we want people to understand, and it's that's not how we communicate. That's not what we want to do as scientists, right? So I'm going to introduce something, something called the Triangle Effective Communication, and it has an asterisk there because this is not about SciComm. This is about communicating with our partners, our parents, our PIs, our colleagues, our friends. This could be communicating with any, anybody. We want to think about these three points of the triangle, the narrative, the self, and the audience. And so I'm going to start off by just talking about self. That is how to reflect on our own practices and our own who we are to be better communicators. And again, this is going to be across the board. So this is something you might want to practice with um, doing this exercise, not just in the science space, right? So the one way in which we fail to, how we miscommunicate, we're going to start with a little bit of our misses here, is we fail to craft our messages. So I had you craft a message right off the bat because I just wanted you to just, again, get the juices flowing. Let's start crafting, right? Just sit down and think about our words and what we want to say. We use jargon, right, and overdue detail. We mentioned that already. We focus on areas of debate. We focus on areas of missing context, and we don't lead with what we know. And sometimes when I say that, that really is, okay, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. From a climate science perspective, people often ask, is that hurricane or was that drought due to climate change? And what a climate scientist will say is they will say, well, the data, um, so there are these models and what we have to consider, and there's always an error of, you know, uh, or a, a function of error or uncertainty or Right? That's what we want to say, because we can't definitively say yes, no. But what if I said this instead? The climate is warming, the earth is warming. That means the ocean and the atmosphere is getting hotter. If we add energy like heat to systems like ocean and atmosphere, we create stronger and more frequent storms. We know these things to be true. And 100 years ago, we predicted that the warming climate would lead to higher frequency and higher and more intense storms. And we've been seeing that. These are the things we know, and these are the things we see. And they are in correlation with one, one another, right? We know these things, and this is what's happening. We don't have to say, well, we're not really sure. Well, we really can't really say. But that's really oftentimes how the conversation goes. So these are things we don't want to do if we're talking about uh, contentious or areas in which there's friction between uh, the public and the scientific community. So we want to lead with what we know. We also want to anticipate misunderstandings. So as I become more, as I talk about climate change for the last 20 years, I know where people get kind of annoyed and like, well, I heard that it's, it's cooling in parts of Alaska, right? So then I know where those, that, kind of where people are going to introduce a misunderstanding where I can kind of clear that up for them. And so the more you communicate, the better you'll be at anticipating misunderstandings, right? We want to focus, oftentimes we focus on the problem and not the solution. So we want, want to be more solution focused. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So this isn't going to be instantaneous. It's going to take a ton of time. It's going to take a ton of practice. I uh, have a lot of experience, but I learn every day. I learn by reading articles. I'll give you a bunch of resources. I learn by um, talking with folks. I learn by interacting and engaging and constantly. Science communication is a lifelong pursuit. We are never done learning. So how do we be better communicators? Well, one, we make our focus. We really think about who our audience is. And one of the things that when people talk about dumbing down science, it's like, no, it's not a chalkboard for me. Because dumbing down science is puts the onus of understanding on my audience then where I'm like, oh, I have to be more dumb for you. When in reality, we as scientists need to be smarter. We need to do a better job. We need to learn about the ticks tips and tools of science communication. Again, understanding where the miscommunication or the misunderstanding is happening. And we want to tackle those problems. And we do that by being better communicators.
right? So we needed to do better and we need to engage. We need to talk with folks and, and again, think about what are the issues that they care about? What are their perspectives? How can I be a little bit more mindful of those things? So our attitudes around science communication need to change. And I can remember the days of my undergrad where people would kind of like look down on people, on our scientists around us who were communicating with the public. And I'm hoping there's less and less of that. But here's the thing, if you don't want to communicate about your science, you don't have to, but we should still create a space where we understand the importance of communication. We don't put people down for doing it or for doing outreach work or for working in minority communities. These are things that we want to champion. So all of our attitudes around how we communicate has to be a little bit of a shift as we're moving through, um, again, the scientific enterprise, which it's doing, which is great. Um, again, there's been a really big shift to think about public understanding instead to think about public engagement. Again, it's not just about what the public knows, it's about how we're engaging with the public. It's about com not about communicating to, it's about communicating with. It's not about having scientific institutions that are in their ivory towers and do their things, it's about having an interaction. We're part of the public, right? You heard this, like I know we're all, even I use that language, like the public and the science, and but we're a part of the public. And so how do we as scientists engage in all of the spaces around us and all of our in all of our communities and sectors um, we uh, want how do we connect on values this is something uh, the last piece about connecting on values is about trusting the messenger because as in my next slide being an effective communicator is not just about what's coming out of the communicator's mouth it's not just about what I'm saying it's about how you all perceive me so you're perceiving me and you're deciding on whether or not you believe what I say. So this is why I start off talking about my background and who I am, because you can relate better to me as a person if you know who I am. People here have been to the Lawrence Hall Science and love the Lawrence Hall Science, so we have something in common there, right? And so again, your perceptions of me as a scientist or me as a communicator is going to affect how you hear what I say and how you interpret what I say. Here's a great article. Again, I'll give you some resources at the end of this um, conversation about our perceptions and attitudes. These things, what this group found is they're determined by how much folks respect the communicator and how much folks trust the communicator. So if we think about respect and trust, so first respect, guess what? People respect scientists. They consider us to have very high prestige. They, doctors, firefighters, scientists, nurses, engineers, they, they do feel like they, res they do respect us. They feel like we are respected fields. Now, the question then is, do they trust us? Because if they're, if they're believing what we say, it's a factor of these two things combined. So we want to make sure that they can trust us. So who do people trust? Well, they trust people who are like them. Do we relate to the folks? Again, folks who are from the Bay Area. We can relate. I'm from the Bay Area too. Folks that are, I'm Latinx. If you're Latinx, you can relate to me in that way, right? These are reasons why our identities are very important to our communication, which I want to note that you're best equipped to communicate to your friends and family. And I say this because if you want to get a message across about some of these more contentious or, or these, these scientific issues that have some friction between the scientists and the public, this is a place where you should be communicating with your friends and families because they're going to trust you. Um, what about if somebody doesn't know if they could trust you? You're just somebody who they met off the street or at a bar or are walk, watching on a Zoom meeting and they don't do a big introduction, giving you all a bunch of different background that you can relate to. Well, what they do is they blindly determine whether or not you have competence and whether or not you're warm. So they actually feel and uh, get a sense for your competency and your warmth, right? Here's the other thing about, oh, so we determine, we already know, I'm going to skip over competency because we know just like respect. We know folks know that scientists are competent people <laughs> most of the time, right? <laughs> Hopefully. So we are considered competent. So the question about whether or not we believe the information that's coming out of our mouths 
we've already hit respect, right? We've already hit competency. It comes down to warmth, whether or not we're friend, we're perceived as friend, or whether or not we're perceived as foe. And so they've done a study about different kinds of fields and how, where they fall on this warmth and competency scale. So we have warmth in our waxies and uh, bloop, 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 where am I? and competency on our x-axis, and we fall into this low warm high competency group with lawyers, CEOs who have been doing a lot of firing in the news lately, accountants, oh my gosh, my, I just realized, my, like, I would have fallen in here if I went down my career path anyways, <laughs> researchers, engineers, scientists. So what that means is that while we are considered competent, we're not considered warm. And there's a lot of implications for what this means. And you can read the study to understand the implications. But our view immediately, if we're putting our, our buckets of friend versus foe, be, again, it's, it's, it's really dependent on that warmth aspect. And I'm concentrating a lot on this because I think it's a message that needs to be very, very clear to scientists that we don't come off as warm people. We don't, and we really need to work hard on that. Again, it's not just about the information coming out of our mouths and how well it's and exciting it is and how accurate it is. It's about how warm we are. So I'm gonna take a moment to kind of reflect about what we're trying to do here as scientists, as a scientific community. We wanna communicate with people around us. We wanna show worthy intentions when we communicate science. And we want to, teachers and professors are more trusted than scientists, so we might want to use that as a way to introduce ourselves if we are a teacher or professor. Um, on that plot, they had a, a higher warmth category. Um, and I want us to not take this lightly, uh, because again, it's going to, if we think about people who are often, let's, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a great example he doesn't come off as very warm, right? And there are things that he does in his hearings that, again, are ways in which scientists or people who are in tech in that scenario are have a bad rep because they are not warm folks in these kind of highly visible scenarios. So where we're communicating either one-on-one -on -one or at a presentation or anything we're doing, again, we want to make sure we're always being warm. We're a combative bunch, right? We've all been in those conference proceedings where people are like, I don't believe you and your research is wrong and I don't know about that. You know, there's a lot of that going on in the research community. We want to tone that down a bit when we're talking with the scientists or with non-scientists, excuse me. All right, now that we've done a real, a, ref, a very ref, a lot, a big reflection on who we are as scientists, we're going to switch over to audience. So we know that the deficit model doesn't work. So what does work? So instead of dispensing more and more information, we're actually going to try to better understand our audience. We're going to ask them questions. We're going to learn about them. We're going to think about who they are. So we're going to think about which which air aspect or areas of my issue or my the thing that I want to convey is most relevant to them. That's going to help you determine what you should prioritize when you're sharing your science or when you're sharing whatever it is you want to communicate. And this is called the lens model. So deficit model out, lens model in. So what this says is that I have a message, it's my core message, great. But I am going to actually frame my message based on who I'm communicating to. So that message is going to have to look different than that every message is going to be different, whether or not I'm a policymaker, a manager, an NGO, a scientist, right? All of those people are should be getting different messages. And the reason for that is because if we do not frame our messages for each one of our audiences, then they're going to interpret my information or your information in the way that they want to. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to provide a message that's very clear and concise for that group so that they understand this is what's relevant to me and this is why I should care. But if they don't get a sense that there's anything's relevant to them, either they'll get the wrong message or they're inter right, they'll interpret it differently or they won't even listen because it's not relevant to them anyways. So our audience, we want our audience to take home the message that we want to convey. So we actually have to formulate messages that are very special to each audience. This is a message 
framing guide um, that's done very, very well um, by Eco America. They've taken lots of times to think about all of these different groups and they've created core messaging around climate change for each one of these groups, which is pretty cool. Um, so take a look at that. I, again, I'll give you that resource also at the end of this talk. Um, here are some potential audiences that you might want to consider engaging with or you have already engaged with. And science enthusiasts, colleagues, reporters, policymakers, children, that's a fun group, right? Um, and when we consider each one of these audiences, we're going to want to consider all of these different things. Their age, their gender, their ethnicity, their culture, their needs, their interests, geographic location, right? Are they somebody or their level of understanding interest, their background? Um, do they have a personal professional goal? I always use, you know, are they somebody who um, is unhoused in the Bay Area? Or are they a rural farmer in Iowa? I need to talk about climate change in a very different way to each one of these people, right? You need to talk about your science in a very different way to each one of these people. And how we do that is going to be thinking about all of these different things. And so, again, we're going to want to have to consider all of, It's a lot, and it's going to take time, but we're going to do it. So we're going to do it now. We're going to go back into that slide deck. And you're going to find your sticky note. You're going to copy and paste your sticky note right next to your old one. And I want you to pick a audience, whatever audience you want, pick one. And I don't want you to say the public. I want you to pick a very specific demographic. And I want you to frame now a new message to that audience. So I'll give you another three minutes to do that. I'm going to set my timer. Let's go back into our sticky notes, copy and paste, and get to work. You got, and why don't you say who the audience is and then give us a little bit of a, of a new message considering who they are and what they might care about and what their background is and all those wonderful things. So I'm going to start the timer and I'll go back to that slide actually. I think that that would be great so we can consider, so you can see all the things you should be considering. I love this. So you can tell, look at this one. Oops. This is great. You can see a change in the way that this is being communicated. I love that. Oh, this is very cool because this is very nurses specifically. I love that. Good job, guys. Keep typing. All right, so move back to my presentation. This is, in my opinion, where things get fun. We're going to work on the narrative now, right? We're going to think about what's actu what are we actually saying? Um, I like to go by the three M's. I've, if you haven't heard, this is miniature, memorable, and meaningful. Miniature, organize your principles in one to three key points. I just did that, right? Miniature, memorable, and meaningful, one to three. Three is easy to remember. It works as a short message. It also enables expansion for longer presentations, so therefore it serves as an outline. I'll give you an example, because climate change, why not? The earth is warming, humans are causing it, and there's something we can do about it. And I can talk about, I can go into how we know the earth is warming, and all the different evidence that there is. I can talk about how we know that it's human induced and not from the sun or from natural variation, right? I know I can go on that down that road if something's really interest somebody's really interested in that, or we can start talking about solutions. So there's all of these ways that I can expand my core three messages, but those are the three messages that climate scientists have decided are the three core. So what, regardless of what you're trying to communicate, you want to do it in three three messages. When I work with scientists. I say, and they're want again to give a public talk like we give all the time. I say, don't start with your conference talks. I know that's where you want to start. Start with a piece of paper and one, two, three. 
And I want you to tell me what are the three things you want your audience to walk away with. Now, create a presentation based off of those three things, right? Less is more. Great example, right? We don't need all those bikes. <laughs> we don't need all those words. We just need to know the facts. Great comic. Don't make your audience do math. I promise it won't work out. Don't even, uh, don't, equations, nope. People shut down. Yes, I <laughs> see your laughing face. <laughs> make your message memorable. Give cues to you and your audience. It helps you remember. It helps your audience remember. We want to use alliteration, similar sounds, anecdotes, pop culture references, really cute and adorable imagery right? Analogies, metaphors. We want to use all of these really fun things in our messages. And we'll get better and better and better at, with that as we go. So one of the reasons I love talking about kind of how there's all this support to show that these things aren't just things we're trying to tell people, but there's actually a reason for why we do this. People have more scientific doubt and skepticism and truths that are farther away from our bodies in scope and time. So things that are very tiny, or things that are very big, things that happen over really long geologic time scales, um, things like that. So we can take this data, like only 4% of people think that, uh, US Americans think that uh, smoking doesn't cause cancer, right? This is a very small number. But if you look down this list, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we get to the Big Bang Theory, right? This is really big, really hard to imagine over really big time scales. So what we wanna do as science communicators, is we want to bring these ideas that are outwards and we want to bring them inwards. We, that's why you want to relate them to our homes and our bodies and our relationships and our pets and things in our everyday lives, to celebrities, right? Things that pop culture references, like I said, things that really, really are in our everyday lives and that are closer to what we can understand and what we have experiences with. Because tiny, 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 you know, molecules or proteins or Anything, you know, receivers, receptors, um, neurons, these types of things are things that oftentimes people are not going to understand also, the little tiny things, right? So we want to make our messages more accessible in that way. In addition, we want to have messages that mean something to me and our audience. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm super excited about science communication. Therefore, I am being very passionate about it, right? Sometimes... Our, the meaning of our work lies in the process. It lies in the adventure. It lies in our experiences, which is why I share that bit with you again. What is the, your, what you're trying to convey, your science or your message? What does it mean to you as a person? And this is an opportunity to, for you to convey passion and frustration and excitement about your work that you might not in a journal article or a conference you know, presentation or something like that, where we really, really want to show that passion. And again, I'm not saying these things are bad to incorporate, but they're not typical. We want to do this work when we're trying to talk about science. We want to create all of these, the passion and the frustration and the excitement. We want to convey that. Here's the article that was got a lot of press recent or a few years ago about how when I'm telling you a story, your brain is actually firing at the same places that my brain's firing as a listener. So we have brain coupling that goes on. And when you turn around and you tell my story to somebody else, their brain couples in the same way that my brain as a storyteller, original storyteller uh, coupled. So we have brain firings in all of these different spaces. So storytelling is a way for us to connect on a, a scientific level, on a deep level, on a, a level that connects us, right, as people, as humans. I love this video, so I always try to show this. I might, um, yeah, we got time. Hey, Pete. Oh, hey, Val. How's it going? You know what, I'm, I'm having a really bad day. What happened? See, what Val's saying when she says, what happened is, tell me a story. And that's actually what this season of Pixar in a Box is all about. To make a movie here at Pixar takes years, but it all starts with a story. Humans have been telling stories since we could speak, probably even before. We tell stories around the campfire. We write plays. We write novels, short stories. We make movies. We take photographs, tweet to each other. The list goes on. The power of story is that it has an ability to connect with people on an emotional level. 
one of the things you hear all the time, this advice is write what you know. Now, as a kid, I was like, I don't want to write about suburban Minnesota. That's boring. I want to write about explosions and monsters and car chases. Well, what that actually means is, yeah, go ahead and write about monsters and explosions and car chases, but put something into it that talks about your own life, how you feel. Do you feel scared? Do you feel alone? Something from your own life will make that story come alive and not just be a boring car chase. When I started directing Monsters Incorporated, the way I would pitch it is, it's about a monster who scares kids for a living, hence his job. He clocks in, he clocks out, he eats donuts and talks about union dues. And we thought that was a pretty funny idea. And sure enough, when I would tell it to people, they would smile. But when we told the story as a film, people started getting bored and restless. And they're like, I don't understand what this movie is about. Well, what I finally figured out was that it's actually not about a monster who scares kids. It's about a man becoming a father. <laughs> that was what was happening to me. So why write about what you know? Well, it's because probably what happened to you made you feel some particular way. And what you're trying to do really when you tell a story is to get the audience to have that same feeling. One of the big revelations for me uh, telling stories is how much work they are, really. I always thought you would just tell the story once and it would be perfect and geniuses like Walt Disney or Miyazaki, this brilliance comes out of their head once and there it is. Well, the truth is our stories don't always come out exactly perfectly the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time up to the 30th time. And so you keep going again and again and again. And only after retelling the story many, many times does it really sparkle. This season of Pixar in a Box is about how we at Pixar tell our stories in hopes that it will inspire you to tell yours. But seriously, what happened? Oh, oh so the first thing, I get to my desk, right? It... I love that video because it brings in a lot of points that I've already talked about, but in a way that's so separate from SciComm, right? So you can see that they're separate in the sense that it, there's nothing to do with science there, but all of these messages that Pixar is providing are messages that obviously are true for scientists as well, as well, right? So some key takeaways that I love from that video is stories have structure. We want to personalize our stories and we want to connect science in a, in a meaningful way that audience can relate to, like he was talking about, right? That's people, what we, they really want to know is what were our feelings? What were our passions? What, how were we, why was, why is the story important to share in the first place, right? Because there's feelings behind it. So stories, and the last point, which I appreciate it, is that stories in Psycom take a lot of iteration. It doesn't just come out perfect the first time, which is why I emphasize communicating, 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 and it's a lifelong pursuit, right? Because we're constantly getting better and we're always going to be find ways that we can improve the way that we're communicating our science. Again, won't be easiest. I go back to that point or instantaneous. It takes time and practice. All right. We've already talked about uh, excluding jargon and acronyms and words with double meanings. I haven't mentioned words with double meanings, actually, so we'll get there, too. But this is a way we really want to fine tune the words itself. And I'm noticing that scientists are doing a much better job across the board, at least the, the scientists that I work with, kind of recognizing what are jargon words and what are not jargon words. But oftentimes, again, we're so deep within in our science that we forget. I actually would all I would use the word anthropogenic until somebody and I honestly forgot that that was a jargon word until somebody was like, what, what, what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not a word people use <laughs> like in normal conversation. Uh, we just had an abstract where somebody submitted the word in their abstract that the word fluvial. And the my colleague said, I don't even know what fluvial means. And I was like, oh, it just means river. So use the word river, right? So, so oftentimes there's just a simple solution. And, but again, these are things that sometimes we don't even know we're doing. So that's why it's really great to, to ask people for feedback and to talk about what are some things that, that I, how am I communicating this that might not be that, that accessible. Um, so here are just some fun ones, you know, that I use as examples, like olfaction, I could definitely hear a scientist saying the word olfaction, right? <laughs> they just mean smell. <laughs> so 
this, while I do feel like scientists are doing a really good job with their jargon, I would say academic speak is something that we all struggle with. And whether or not you're a librarian or a scientist or anyone who's communicating, this is something that scientists do and again they don't even realize they're doing it and this is the way in which we talk where every single individual word it's not jargon it experienced difficulty all normal words maintaining vertical orientation but when you put those words together you really can just say that in a much cleaner way like it had trouble staying upright and this is actually a really big problem among scientists that I oftentimes when people are giving their practice talks to me, I'm writing as fast as I can what they just said. Because again, so they can say that these are words you don't you don't need to combine to make a sentence. <laughs> you can say something else in much plainer language. So a multi-pronged approach will be necessary to address parameters of the epidemic. Scientists will use lots of different strategies to defeat the disease. Right? So we can see how, again, these sentences aren't jargony, maybe multi-pronged, but these sentences, these words are not jargony. Again, it's just pulling them all together and it's just not really making all that much sense for folks who is not kind of engulfed in that language to begin with. Um, and again, that, that separates folks when you do that. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Um, Passive voice, I give you some examples. I won't spend too much time thinking about passive voice, but scientists and science communicators are trained to use passive voice. And again, that, that's fine, but when we want to communicate outside of those spaces, we want to be very active. The planet was struck by an asteroid and the atmosphere became filled with debris. And asteroids slammed into the planet, shooting clouds of debris into the air. So you can actually kind of get a picture. The mice were injected with a drug. The research injected mice with the drug, right? Um, sorry if this is hard to see. There's also a vague language. Um, again, this is another way that we can convey some really cool things in a way that we wouldn't normally as scientists, like magic mushrooms were highly effective in spurring a positive behavioral chain. People who took magic mushrooms were happier and calmer. Happier and calmer. These are words that we can relate to as opposed to positive behavior change. I like this one. The researchers created a relaxing environment. Well, what'd they do? The researchers dimmed the lights, provided a soft couch, and played classical music at a low volume. And we understand that that's a relaxing environment, but it helps us take this, these words and create an image. Whereas relaxing environment just doesn't do that, right? So I can create an image in my listeners or my reader's mind by just giving a little bit more detail about what we actually did. These aren't, this isn't vague at all. We want vivid details. And the last one, this double meaning. Here are some words that scientists use, again, because they have really effective meaning, like the word uncertainty. That means range. But in the non-scientist world, this means confusion. When we use a word like feedback, we mean a cycle, positive cycle, a negative cycle. But in the non-science world, this means praise, oftentimes, most of the time. Bias is a good one. Offset of observation versus political motivation, being politically motivated, right? That's what bias means. Values, theory, enhance, model. These are all words that are very specific to scientists that mean very specific things. That is not the same as what the public is going to think about when they hear those words. So we're going to avoid these words, actually. Um, and here's a whole list of them. Again, here's a reference for you. I'll provide you the slides and the references and everything afterwards. And I've already mentioned po using positive words. So um, we want to stay positive in our communication, ingenuity, innovation, entrepreneurship, um, entrepreneurship harnessing, rising, overcoming, competing, right? Instead of sort of these regularly reduced control, cut, control, conserve, these are things that are gonna kind of turn people off. And we know that by decades and decades of research and how people respond to some of these uh, conversations that we're trying to have. 
I'm not sure if you've heard of or you've seen, but maybe um, something called the inverted pyramid. And this is the way in which scientists communicate. We provide a lot of background to begin with and details, and then we get to our, our results and conclusions. Whereas bottom line, you know, you pick up an article in the New York Times, you click on an article from the Washington Post, what's the first thing you read, right? The lead, it says, scientists found cure for AIDS, right? That's what it tells us, that results and conclusions is right up front. That's what people want to hear. That's how we keep them interested. That's how we keep them engaged. We want to know, we don't need to keep them waiting right, for where we're going with that. Um, so what we're going to do next is I'll give you maybe a little bit of time to just reflect now because I do want to get to the, to the last few of my slides before we end. Um, on, I want you to think now we're still considering an audience, but we want to add an analogy, a metaphor, a story, a pop culture reference. We want to look, want to take a deeper look at what we wrote in our, in our sticky notes. Did we have jargon? I saw a few jargon words in there. Um, is there academic speak and is there vague language? So why don't we just reflect? I won't necessarily spend the full, you know, five minutes going through those, but why don't we look at those notes now and just reflect on what we wrote and see if there's an exciting way. Um, you can write, you can add to the sticky notes if you want, but I'll kind of just take a minute to kind of think about how we might want to add some, some of those key things. I was reading that note. <laughs> it <just> disappeared. <laughs> oh, you're moving it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just I again. I just wanted you to sort of not maybe spend too much time on this because this is like I said. This is where things get fun. So you might want to take time. Maybe you have an ideas in your head. Um, maybe there's ways in which that you know you you want to think more critically about this um, later on. But I think that again, this is where this is where I feel like things can get really interesting and really fun when we when we have when we want to communicate something. And after these conversations and workshops I've had, I actually have had people contact me and be like, can I practice something out with you? And I'll work through it with you. I'm happy to do that. All right. So communication opportunities. So they're sort of the traditional route, meaning promoting your science through a communication office um, or pitching a story to a news site. So in some uh, universities, you might want to go to your university press office before you pitch a story, but you can do that. Um, you can, so these are more, again, traditional media, ways in which we uh, create traditional media. If you're going to talk to reporters, these are just, t there's entire workshops on talking with reporters. So talk about, uh, this is a general psychom. I'm hitting everything a little bit. You can go talk to your comms office at your university, or at your um, research organization, and they might already have something prepared to share with you. So be prepared. Simplify your message. Again, the no jargon piece is going to be key. Practice sound bites, because whether or not you're a radio article or a print article or a virtual article, electronic article, they're going to quote you. And so you want to practice some good quotes. They're not happenstance, right? People actually come in prepared with like really cool things to say because they know that you, again, you don't want your listener to interpret your information. You want to do all the cool stuff for you. Um, and we want, at the end, this is a point I've asked, uh, I've added because a lot of times people will be, will say that the journalist misrepresented them in their article. And what I would do is if you're a scientist who's talking to a reporter, I would ask at the end of your interview, ask that reporter to summarize what your research or what you just said to make sure that they got it right. Because I guarantee they might say something you'll be like, well, okay, so what you just said, like, that's true, but let's get down to business about how, what I, what I really wanted to say or how to make that a little bit more clear so that they're not creating, they're not misrepresenting you in their journal in their, um, excuse me, their popular, you know, in their media releases and things like that. Um, so these are non-traditional sources. So we'll press release, op-ed, personal websites. I go to sci like scientist research at UC Berkeley. I don't understand anything on their website. So 
who's the website for? Right? <laughs> for me, because I don't understand a lick and I'm a scientist. So this is something that we want to stay conscious of, right? If it's not for me at all, it's just for, well, here's the thing. Most of the time, those research pages are for incoming graduate students, right? Or for undergrads who might want to work in a lab. And I guarantee a lot of the language on those websites is not accessible. Um, blogs, maybe you want to edit some Wikipedia articles using social medias, um, mobile apps and games. This is really exciting to do, right? These are ways that we can engage. All those communication strategies apply. This is what media landscape used to look like. It is evolving. It will continue to evolve. All of our communication strategies apply. Hands-on exhibits. These are more opportunities. Nerd nights, cafes, mentoring, local school work, infographics, lab zines, lab visits, museums, public lectures, policy, over-the-fence neighbor talking, citizen science. All strategies apply. These are my tips for public talks because I do this so often. Again, break your science up into three parts. Tell us why we should care. Use anecdotes, especially from the lab or from the field. Show us pictures. It's been shown that women are more connected to uh, scientists' work if they can see photos of them in the field and in the lab. Women over men. So we want, of course, we want to get women as excited about science as we do everyone else. So we want to add photos of people in the field. Use props. Use multimedia. Again, don't use equations at all. If you're presenting data, great. We want a data literate society. I'm all about data. But guess what? You better keep it simple and you better be prepared to walk us through a plot or the data every detail. What is the x-axis? What is the y-axis? What is the one line? Don't add multiple lines. What is the one line or what is the one data point that you're that's moving that you're showing? And in the end, what does it mean? Why do I care? Summarize why I'm even showing you that plot in the first place, right? X, y-axis. Walk us through it all. Record yourself. Watch for academic speak. Write out what you want to say. I think writing it out is actually really helpful if you're giving a public talk. Practice in front of others. And finally, of course, have fun. I love this path to engagement. If you go to this AGU Sharing Science site, you can click. If you're like, oh, do I want to engage? Do I not want to engage? Who do I want to engage with? How do I want to do it? And if you hover over each one of these little boxes, it'll give you a set of resources to do that work. How cool is that? So I'll share that with you at the end so that you can actually get resources from this website about how to do all of this, these different things. How do you write a blog post? How do you tell a story? What, what's your, what are some tips for joining your PTA? Um, here are my resources. We got newsletters, workshops. We got websites. Website resources, more, everything you could ever imagine in here. And also, I'm going to tell you to go to your subject-specific society. I guarantee they have some resources. If you're a physicist, if you're a librarian, if you're a who's it, what's it, you have a society, they want you to be communicating, and they're going to help you do that. I guarantee it. Opportunities. List out some opportunities for you. And, of course, I do not want to ignore, I have a whole whole presentation on inclusive SciComm. Join me next time or the next time. I can't remember what month it is, but I will be giving the entire presentation on inclusive SciComm. But here are some inclusive SciComm uh, resources for you. And that's it. We have some time, a few minutes for questions. I know there's already questions in the audience, so I'm happy to read those and take those over. I don't know if, if Tiffany, if you want to help me navigate that or if I should just start scrolling. Oh. I have one question. Sure. Um, well, there was actually two. Uh, you saw the one from Rachel, though, about the librarians and the oh. circles, and you felt we were warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I believe, I, I, I recently, within the last year or two, I remember reading some research in reference to that, too, and we are considered, like, a, a person that the general public can trust, like a teacher or somebody like that. So... Yes. I like very warm in my in my opinion. <laughs> yes. So yes, we are trusted folks out there in the community. 
good. And go, I'll, again, I'll send out the resource. That article is, is very interesting. And again, it, it, it talks a lot more about what this means. What are the implications? Um, and what do people who perceive those folks in those career spaces, um, well, how do they actually feel when they're inter interacting with those people? It's a great, it's a great study. Um, great. Thank you for adding that bit. Yep, and then there's another question from Kate, and she's asking to what extent to university PR, I, I think that's due, to what extent do university PR communication offices measure the impact of their work on traditional and non-traditional research impact metrics? Oh, great question. Um, so they're going to be measuring impact on in any way that they can get right, uh, data and statistics. So they're definitely going to be tracking any kind of linking. Um, if they send out a newsletter, I guarantee they're going to be tracking who's touching what, um, how long they spend on a website, where they're coming to that news source from, whether or not it's from social, whether or not it's from a press release, whether or not it's from. So they, I, the, the um, press office are now incorporating all types of way to uh, look at this data, including from social media. So they're tracking, there's now huge, you know, entire groups of people who are in charge. I feel like back in the day when universities used to hire the intern to do the social media, no, 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 no more. These are people who have d bona fide degrees who've been working in the space, who think about how to do this and how to do this effectively. And they're going to be the best resource on how you can contribute to that work with them um, on social media. Um, and again, they're, they're, they definitely are taking metrics on all of that. And they're creating goals. And their goals are always to increase engagement. And so if you, are, if you come at them, they're going to want, as somebody as a resource for providing content or providing engagement, they're going to they're love that. So... And there's probably programs and avenues for you to do that work without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I talk a lot more about that, about just providing, uh, or excuse me, utilizing partnerships and utilizing already existing programs in my systemic racism in SciComm talk too. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have another question for from Mike, and he's asking, do you have a recommendation, recommendations for how folks can identify likely areas of misunderstandings in their audience before their presentation? Oh, say that again, sorry. It says, do you have recommendations for how folks can identify likely areas of misunderstandings in their audience before the presentation? Oh, um, okay, so if you're like a, a presentation, like a public talk or things like that, is that, that that's what I assume that that's referencing. Um, so what I would do is, again, if this is a space where you're on Zoom, and it's for a specific audience like, uh, you know, or, or it's not for a specific audience, it's open to the public, then there's really no way to super understand. But if you, if, if your presentation is being targeted to a specific audience, then there's a lot better ways to be able to be ready for that, right? Is you know uh, that this presentation is only going to allow people with a .edu to, to Zoom in. Perfect. Now you know everyone is in a setting in which they have a .edu. I mean, not, even those sorts of things are going to help clue you in. But what if you're giving a talk at a conference versus a talk at a cafe, which are some of the things that I do, right, and that I prepare people for? So what I think about, what I tell our, our, our presenters is that what are we going to think about? They're interested because they're here, right? They have um, an incentive to be here. Okay, and they all live likely in the East Bay because they're present. So the East Bay politics, the East Bay, uh, I'm going to think about how much money people make in the East Bay. What's our average or is there a wide range? So I'm going to think about how they fall on that spectrum. I'm going to think about what are some past 
you know, what is the past voting, you know, some voting measure, how did that go? I can look at all of these different things to try to think about how my audience might misinterpret. For example, Bay Area and, and or the East Bay, Berkeley in general is very, very, very like anti-GMO. Whereas the scientific community is like, I mean, we have buttons that say I love GMOs. So how do we deal with that? in the Bay, that's something that I know is an issue in the Bay Area, right? Or in, in the Berkeley community. So anyways, there there are things that you can kind of think about as it relates to, again, whether or not you're in person, whether or not you're on Zoom, whether or not they're showing up, they're interested, <laughs> right? <laughs> or let's say our scientists will go to festivals uh, and some, they're not science festivals, these are street fairs. So these are just people off the street, which is great because it means it's not people, you're going to where they are. That's something I tell scientists to do all the time. Show up in their communities, show up in their spaces. Don't make them come to a university, right? They're not going to get there. You want to show up where people are because then you're, you're, it's default that you're in their face. It's not that they've clicked a link or clicked an article. They've chosen to go there. Um, so I'm advocating for being in public spaces. Um, <laughs> but also then that's where they're not interested. They're, they're just there. And so in that way, again, it's going to be a little bit harder, but you can, as long as you kind of, uh, about that understanding those uh, preparing for those misinterpretations or miscommunication or misinformation, all of that. The, again, the more and more and more you communicate with your community, the more and more and more and more you're going to get a broad breadth of ways in which people uh, essentially have those those points where where there's a disconnect. You're going to be at much better and better at at knowing where those are and how to prepare for those. Um, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.